Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this Women in Business webinar brought to you by Exonia Bank. My name is Peggy Stebbins, and I am the Chief Financial Officer at Exonia Bank. At Exonia Bank, our mission is to provide unmatched value and service to our business and consumer customers within an independent, locally owned bank. We have seven locations to serve you. Our newest location is located downtown Milwaukee at 611 East Wisconsin Avenue. We have a talented team of professionals and would welcome the opportunity to discuss your banking needs and financial goals. Our Women in Business program is focused on supporting and empowering women in all aspects of the business world. While we all continue to deal with COVID-19, we want to make sure we are also maintaining our focus on providing you with topics and resources that are of value to you. Before I introduce our guest speaker, we have a couple of housekeeping items. We ask that you stay muted and keep your cameras off during the presentation. This session is being recorded and the video and PowerPoint slides will be available to all the guests after the event. There will be a question and answer session at the end of the presentation and we encourage you to ask questions in the chat function. Our guest for today's webinar is Sue McKenzie Dix, Vice President of Healthy Culture at Rogers Behavioral Health. Sue McKenzie Dix has led the development of educational programs and collaborative projects in the health field at a local, state, and national level. Ms. Dix provided national training under grants from CDC, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, and the Department of Education. As the Vice President of Healthy Culture, Rogers Behavioral Health, she provides leadership to internal culture efforts, including equity, and facilitates WISE Initiative for Stigma Elimination. Sue will be discussing strategies for us as we consider what we can do to support mental well being, resilience, and a healthy workplace culture, especially in these unusual times. We will explore conceptual models and activities that encourage shared accountability at all levels of an organization and even in families. We are honored to have Sue with us today. And with that, I will turn it over to Sue. Thanks so much, Peggy, and really good to be with you all today. Um, it, it's quite an opportunity to be able to share work that's been happening collaboratively since early 2017 when people came together across Wisconsin and beyond to help us think about um, what does it mean to be compassion resilient. Mm -hmm. And we initially looked at people in helping professions. And since we've been doing this work, we have pulled in, been pulled into all sectors of the business environment. Um, as of course, the last couple of years have really led us to understand that our well-being is so tied to our interactions with each other, along with the decisions that we make as an individuals. And so part of what I'll be sharing with you today is, is maybe more focused on team than you would have expected. Um, we will share some individual um, information about well-being and, and building our own individual resilience, but you'll see that almost all of what we talk about is in the context of our relationship with others. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and we will be off and running. I am, of course, like almost any presenter, really enjoy interaction. And this is not a format that allows us to do a typical level of interaction. But I will at times be asking you to um, put some thoughts in the chat just so we can begin to see, um, to see where each other's at on some of these different topics. And I want to just start by acknowledging that what I'm going to be sharing with you is the combined wisdom, not only of many people over the last three or four years, but us reaching back into our history, our ancestors, um, that wisdom has flown through time to this moment that we have the opportunity to learn from so many with us and those who aren't with us anymore. So just want to acknowledge that. So I've used the word compassion resilience and I wanna just start by a level of a definition to help us kind of wrap our brain around that as well as culture. So if I were to look in the dictionary, I would expect to find this first bullet point that compassion resilience is about our ability to return to that place of empathy, strength and hope 
after the realities of the world around us, right? That there is this human being that we would like to be, and then there is how we interact in the world and the impact that that has on us. My, probably the mantra that I carry with me from this work is that for me to be compassion resilient, I need to find a level of optimism in the midst of imperfections that the imperfections that we see all around us in ourselves and others in our systems and our world, that you know, we can't help but to notice that things aren't as we would like them to be and that to be resilient and to maintain a level of compassion, it's connecting with a level of optimism that we can carry into that reality. And then I think about culture because this really has turned out to be about culture work. And so culture is that essence of how groups of people interact. It's a pattern of knowledge and beliefs and behavior. And so as we go through this content today, a high level overview of content that met is really ends up being hours of conversations and activities that, that people do together in groups and teams. Um, but I want us to think about how some of our own beliefs and patterns might be challenged as we look at how to become more and more compassion resilient. So of course, the first question we wanna start with is why do this work in the first place? And when I think about the why, I really wanna start with some, your vision. When you think about a compassionate workplace culture, what are some words or phrases that come to mind that would describe if we had a workplace culture that truly was compassionate what would it look like for us? And that is your first opportunity just to put some words or phrases in chat as we can start to hear from each other. Attentive, listening, kind, a level of caring, it's meaningful and relevant. So who wouldn't want to work in a, a culture that you're describing here? Grow, aspiring to be better, understanding different perspectives, really desiring to understand different perspectives. I think most of us would look at that and say, yes, that's the culture that I would like to work in. And we're gonna look at some things that can get in the way of that. Not, and, and it's really a collective understanding of just what it means to be human and what we collectively can do as humans to create the culture that we would like. I use the word um, accountability a lot. I, I think that this work really leads us to understand our individual responsibility and accountability to our culture, as well as our team and organizational accountability to the cultures that we work in. And then the second question that I put out here for you is why do this work now? And I, I don't think we need to spend a lot of time talking about that. I think it's obvious that now is the time um, that with so much that has happened in the world around us, whether it's COVID, whether it's understanding how we interact together across political, religious, racial differences, just we could go on and on of what we've seen in the last couple of years that at times feels like is more divisive than unifying, is more um, taking people down rather than building us up to be the people we wanna be. Certainly feels like the right time. And we are getting more and more requests, whether it's from school districts, social service organizations, people are tired and people care. And, and how can they continue to care at the level that they need to and, and deal with some of the frustrations and fatigue that, that exist? So obviously now is the time for us to be asking these questions. The good news is that research behind this work, different components of what I'm gonna share with you today, really points to that when an organization focuses on building a compassion resilient culture, that resilience builds more success, that organizations find that whatever it is they're trying to accomplish, they're more likely to accomplish it when they have a culture that you've defined already in the chat. That employees and leaders stay. We talk a lot about retaining employees and we know the impact of losing employees. And the research is pretty clear about loss of leaders has an even greater impact 
on the overall culture and success of an organization. Focusing on this also helps build just a foundation of collegial supports that we know we have each other's backs and what it looks like to have each other's backs in the work environment. And then of course the economic impact of um, a lot of turnover, um, just that alone we can point to. And then of course, whether issues come up that can't be solved and then we have to get legal and other entities involved in that economic strain on organizations when we don't have the cultures that support us. And then I really like this number five, the last one. It just makes so much sense. But if your organization is about innovation, if it values innovation, then your organization must also value employee and team well-being because people simply cannot be in an innovative space when they're too fatigued to be able to work together towards a, a mission. So innovation really requires us to look at the culture of our workplace. So this is a quick overview. These seven points will, will define the work that we are doing with organizations. And certainly internally at Rogers, we've been doing this work for the last two and a half years in earnest. And I'll be sharing some examples from various places that we've done the work but first of all, we really believe that we need to step back and develop common language because this is about having conversations in the workplace. And oftentimes we use words that um, have many different meanings are very personal, like the word respect. It's a great word, but you and I could argue about what's respectful and disrespectful for ours. And so we're really working in the initial part of our work to help people come together with a common language. And so we, we have a model for what does it mean to act with compassion and help organizations to then apply that model. So we can begin to talk about whether an act was compassionate or not and what would it would take to move it towards compassion. We think it's important to understand this notion of fatigue and not just to say I'm fatigued, but to break it down as to what is leading us to that place so we can have the right level of conversation. And I'll be sharing that with you. I'm not gonna go into the compassionate action um, part of it, but I will share with you where you can get all of these resources. And as we look at what's driving our fatigue, we'll also look at our locus of control. You know, Where is it that we have power? And how do we exercise our power up to people that maybe have more power than us in areas that are driving our fatigue? We will look at what it means to the, the role of expectations, how really important expectation setting is, how it's done and what are the components of appropriate expectation setting. We'll look at boundaries, both personal and team boundaries and how they, from kind of a different um, viewpoint than often we talk about boundaries, we're gonna, we, when you think of boundaries, you think of your no's, we're actually gonna start with our yeses and then we'll move into no's that support our yeses. And all of this will come together to think about how do we create a sense of accountability in our organizations for the culture. And of course, throughout, we'll be weaving some self-care practices. And then I'll um, let you know about some further resources that are about us being able to take care of ourselves individually and bring our best selves to our team and our organization. That's an overview of the work that we do. And I'm gonna delve now into some of the specifics to give you what I consider the highlights that we've learned as we've worked with organizations and internally at Rogers over time. So this first piece I'm sharing with you is the um, Compassion Fatigues Path. We um, worked with Eric Gentry, permission to use his cycle, and then we added the cats just to give some good visuals. And Eric Gentry came back to us and asked if he could use our cat images now moving forward because they really do help people to, to remember some of these concepts. But I'd like for you, and, and a lot of our time together, I'm going to ask you to reflect on your own experience. So I'd like for you to reflect back to when you first started in your current position when you were first offered this particular job and the state of mind that you were in about starting something new, starting a new position. For many of us, we begin in what we call the zealot stage. That is when we are really mission focused, excited, 
ready to bring our full self. This is when people use terms like, oh, she gives 150%, which of course is ridiculous because the most you can give is 100%. But that gives you a notion of what this zealot stage is like. You wanna bring it all, you wanna go the extra mile. And the reality is that's the first stage of fatigue because I can't think of a job that I would describe as a sprint. Our jobs are marathons. Our jobs are about getting up every day and coming to work, whether it's me in my office in my own home or someone else who's coming to work in a bank or in a school. We come to work day in and day out and we have mission and goals that drive us. And that day-to-day -day work that we do is really about the skills and strategies of running a marathon. And so the very first stage of fatigue is actually the zealot stage. And as you think about some of your times in your career where you felt like a zealot, I'd love for you also to think about, did anyone come alongside of you? Maybe the person that was your supervisor or a mentor in the workplace and help you to think about conserving your energy for the marathon? Or did people dump a lot of things on your plate because you were the willing soul to do it all? Right. That, that's an example of individual and organizational practices that, that can lead to problems. And so when we work with managers, we ask, what are you doing in those first stages of someone's work to help them to understand the reality of the marathon? So we come to work, we're excited to do the work that we do. And then we begin to look around. And this is where imperfect, our, our knowledge of imperfections start to come in. Maybe I look at myself and say, well, I'm not so sure I've got what it takes to do this job. Or I look at colleagues and I think, hmm, they don't seem to be given the same level that I'm given to this. Or maybe I thought they were going to know more about this than they do. Or I may look up at my leader and wonder if my leader is the right person for the job and question that. I may look at the people that I serve and question them. I may look at the systems around me and start to question the systems. I know for some of us who work in, in like education and healthcare, we might look to the child welfare system and wonder, mm, is it strong enough to actually work alongside of us to support the people that we care so much about? So it's really that kind of opening our eyes to the reality of the imperfections around us. And it can lead to irritability, cynicism, really a sense of hopelessness when we came in already to do the best and found that there were some barriers along the way. And so that second stage is defined as the irritability stage. And I really link that with the notion of imperfection. It's my knowledge of imperfection. If I don't know what to do with all of that, if I haven't developed strategies and skills, um, then most often the complexity of the work starts to overwhelm me. So I'm excited, I come in, I start to see imperfections and as I dig into the imperfections, it starts to get complex. Hmm, things don't change overnight. People have been trying to work on this for the last couple of years and it hasn't changed yet. I begin to understand the complexity of getting to the ideal that we want in the workplace. And that complexity, normal human reaction to complexity is to back up a little bit, right? I'm a little overwhelmed. I need to back up just to protect myself, to, to regroup. Sometimes that looks like absenteeism or showing up, but not really being present for the work. We can begin to see some physical illnesses start to crop up as we are impacted by the complexity around us. Maybe just chronic exhaustion. I, I feel more tired in my work than I used to. Um, and then again, if I haven't developed some skills and strategies, some understanding, some reality testing, um, some supports for myself, I can move into the zombie stage. And the zombie stage often develops as someone over time through all these stages, people tend to isolate more and more, right? I, because I'm seeing imperfection, I'm just going to stay away from that. I can't deal with this situation with the family, so I'm not even going to ask that question anymore. I um, have withdrawn, so I'm, I'm less connected to my team. And yet I'm still showing up and doing my, my job. And the zombie looks 
typically like people who have their walls up, they're working in isolation. And oftentimes when we begin to work in isolation, we start to get an overinflated sense of our own importance. Like I know about everyone else's problems. I'm doing my thing in my little place. I'm going to come and just do it. And don't question me because, you know, I'm doing I'm doing what I know I need to do in my little space. And so oftentimes people that are in the zombie stage can look pretty prickly. And we really don't, even as supervisors, you're not sure if you want to engage them because you're not, you're not sure what the interaction is going to be like. So you can see the role of leaders and mentors along this, this path of fatigue and how important it is for us to, first of all, normalize these stages and then to begin to be able to have conversations about renewal versus being unwell. And hopefully those conversations start right away at the zombie stage, that we're not waiting for people to get to the zombie stage to say we really need to intervene and support people. Because if you get nothing else from today, I really want you to understand that compassion fatigue is the normal response to complex and overwhelming circumstances. So if you have a work environment where you feel like people are feeling like right now is a complex and overwhelming time, you can expect fatigue. And we wanna normalize that so people can actually talk about it much earlier in the process and we can begin intervening. So last thing we wanna do is have this be about shame and blame because people are overwhelmed in the workplace. Well, I'm gonna take just a quick break to do something individually for us. So as I said, we weave this throughout our work. So I wanna weave it throughout our time here. And I want you to ask yourself, again, a reflective question for you. What are you doing when you think about your life? What are you doing when you feel most like you, most alive, most yourself? What are you doing? Who are you surrounded with? Kind of get that image of aliveness. And then ask yourself, are you at work? Are you not at work? I know that many times when I do this live, I'll ask people to raise their hand if they're at work. And I've been in a group of 300 people and five people raised their hand that they were at work in their mind. And no right or wrong to that one. Um, but one of the things it tells me that if I think I know my colleagues and I don't know who they are when they are most alive, I've all, I'm already going into situations making assumptions based on what I think I know about somebody else. So interesting question to ask your team. What are you doing when you feel most alive? And then, of course, the second question is now let's think about work. When you're at work, when do you feel most alive? What are you doing when you feel most alive at work? Think about your day and how it's structured and how many times do you get that experience of feeling alive in the workplace? We're gonna talk in expectations about this notion of 70% and 100%. I'd like to think that the things that make me feel most alive are the times when I show up at my 100%. And maybe there's some other things that it's okay for me to show up at 70%. Because like I said, we can't be 100% 100% of the time. Right? We have to make some of those decisions. So really identifying what makes you feel alive at work. And then my last question on this one for you to reflect on is when you go home for work, when you leave your office, when you are with somebody else at the end of your work day, or you're texting somebody else or on the phone with somebody else and someone says, how was your day? Do you tend to report all that went wrong in your day? If you are like most humans in the United States, that's what you report. You report the things that went wrong. Nothing wrong with that. We all need validation that some things are hard. But just a challenge I wanna throw out to you. What we know about trauma is that when I experience something bad, my body feels it. When I talk about it, my body feels it. When I talk about it again, my body feels it. So at some level, sharing what went wrong in my day is impacting my body and may not it may have moved beyond validation and so in the next couple of weeks i challenge you to just add to your report about your day something that made you feel alive in your day and notice what it does to you and notice what the impact that it has on the person that's asking you about your day 
just an opportunity for us to play with this notion of what do I need validated and what do I choose to put out there about my work day. So just quick self-care break there. Now we're gonna move into um, four areas of the work that we do that are really focused on um, teams. And the first area is identifying what drives our fatigue and resilience. The second is setting clear expectations. The third is those compassionate boundaries. And then fourth is what can we do to define the culture that we want? So again, I'm gonna ask you to, to reflect and ask yourself when it comes to your work, what drives your fatigue? See if, if you have something to write with, write it down. If you can think of, maybe think of five things in your work environment that add to your fatigue, that keep you from being the person you want to be at times. And then also what drives your resilience at work? What helps you to feel resilient in the workplace? And I'm just gonna share this activity with you. This is something you can take back to your teams. When we do this activity, it, it, leaders are often involved. Uh, matter of fact, we're doing this with a school district where we have 17 principals and the administrative team. And we had the 17 principals do this activity. And then we escalated some of what they had to say up to the administrative team. And then the administrative team came back and had a vulnerable, transparent conversation back with the principals about some of the things they heard from the principals. So this is, this is structured very purposefully to be something that leaders are prepared to respond to, as well as the individuals creating the list are thinking about their place in all of this. So I'm just going to give you an example of, of having done this activity with the group. And um, they, first of all, they listed all the things that were driving their fatigue and the things that were driving their resilience. And then we went back together as a group and we asked them to think about, do you feel like you have control over this driver of fatigue? So too many initiatives. This particular group, it's red because they didn't feel like they had control over that. It, there's an L next to it because they believe that the leadership of that group had some control over that. So they look to leaders to have control over that one. Paperwork. That documentation paperwork some always shows up on people's list. And this particular group did not feel like they had control over that. And they look to leaders to have some control. Focusing on the problem. When we always focus on the problem, they felt like that drive their fatigue. It's blue because they felt like, yeah, we, we, got, we have some control over that. Not complete control, but yes, as individuals, we have control. Um, just going to skip down to the one green one here, competing home versus job responsibilities. They felt like that was something that they was under their control. And they looked to leaders to help with that. Right? So I have control over that, and I look to my leader to help with that. So they went through this process of identifying where they had control, where they didn't have control. And let me tell you, this isn't about consensus. It's actually an opportunity for people to begin to think about locus of control. I've often had people, you know, four people in the same position, and we call up one of these and three people say, nope, no control. And the fourth says, nah, actually, wait a minute, how I talk about that to my supervisor. So it gets the group thinking about control and what does control look like and invites people who have kind of that external locus of control where everything's somebody else's issue. It invites them to begin to learn from their colleagues that, wait a minute, maybe we do have some control here in our environment. And it gives the leaders an excellent list for them to look over and, and say as leaders, yeah, you're looking to me for control over this, but I actually don't feel like I have a lot of control over this one. Can we put it on we can't control for now list? And the leaders may say, we absolutely feel like we have control here and this is something we're working on. Or they may come back and say, 
yes, we think that we have control in this area, but we really need to work with you collaboratively to figure out what, what this can look like. So that's the kind of conversation that leadership has based on this activity. Even if they're in the room going through, we just did this with the social service agency in Milwaukee and the, the senior leaders were in the room with all the other leaders. And yet still the senior leaders went and had their own conversation and came back the next session and said, let us tell you what we're thinking about in terms of our role as leaders around drivers of fatigue and resilience. The other question that we ask of groups is when you come together as a team, how much time do you spend talking about the things in red? The things that you've just told me you have no control over. What percentage of time when you come together as a team do you spend talking about these? And some groups will say, oh, we got that. We never go over 20%. And others will say, oh, 80% of the time we come together, we're talking about all this stuff we can't control. And so then we ask them, well, how much time do you want to spend talking about the things you can't control? And so whatever percentage they come up with, except for I always tell them zero is not the answer. We need validation that sometimes things are hard, right? So, but think about how much time do you really wanna spend as a team? They come up with a percentage, it's usually around 15%. And then we ask them, how will you communicate that when you're together as a team and you feel like you've gone way over that 15% talking about things you can't control, how do you wanna communicate with that, with each other? Some people do hand signals, some people have a word they say, um, but it's starting to create a structure around dealing with negativity. When you ask teams what drives fatigue, quite often it's the negative culture of the team, and yet we haven't given them a structure for how to address negativity. And so out of this activity, they've decided on the structure that they would like to deal with negativity on their team. If you think about drivers of fatigue, they quite often have to do with unclear or unrealistic expectations. So it just makes sense that the next thing we look at here is what about expectations? Um, we know that expectations are really our thoughts about how things should be. And expectations involve three things. If I expect something of you, you ought to expect me to tell you the why of my expectation, the what of my expectation, and the how of my expectation. That's something that if I am going to set an expectation for someone else, that person has the right to ask me, give me the why of that one, Sue. I'm, I'm not quite sure what, you know, why are we doing this in the first place? Or that all sounds good, but no one's helped me with the how to get it done, right? So even just breaking expectations down on those three components helps conversations to happen more often. Then we, we look at expectations, not just the expectations people have of us or we have of others, but it probably won't surprise you that the, actually the most problematic expectations in the workplace are the ones we have of ourselves. Most of us tend to have unrealistic expectations of ourselves, And how I act when I don't reach my own expectation can vary, right? So, so we want people to look at their expectations of themselves. We want to be sure that our expectations align with reality. I mentioned the 70, 100 rule that, you know, if I expect myself to connect with 100% of employees at Rogers, that every interaction is going to be one where I walk away saying that was a great connection. That's an unrealistic expectation of me as a human being. Um, and if I carry that expectation, it can really impact how I feel about my work and how I feel about my colleagues. Um, so we look in this section around expectations in multiple directions of all the ways that expectations fly around us and really encourage all of us when to, first of all, recognize when an expectation exists and to get curious about that expectation. Is it the right expectation? And can I talk about the why, the what, and the how of that expectation? Really clear to me that we've got a lot of people talking about accountability that haven't first had the conversation about expectations. And I believe it's unethical to hold someone accountable to an expectation that hasn't been clearly defined. Um, so we work with teams to think about and to surface what expectations aren't clear. 
when we give the information from that driver's activity to leaders, we also have an opportunity where we ask employees to um, anonymously define expectations that feel unclear or maybe actually feel like a barrier to the mission of the organization. And we share that also with the leaders. So the leaders can come back and, oh, wow, I didn't realize that this expectation wasn't clear. Here I've been upset about it not being met, but I didn't realize where clarity was lacking. And at the same time, we want employees to be able to be really clear about the why, the what, and the how in their question. I get the why. I am so behind this expectation. I really just need to understand the how. Very different conversation than I can't believe you expect this of me. Um, so we're helping people to have conversations at the level that they need to have them rather than avoid the conversations and um, move to what Brene Brown would say is resentment. Brene Brown really positions this word resentment around boundaries. Compassionate people ask for what they need. They say no when they need to. And when they say yes, they mean it because their compassion, their compassionate boundaries keep them out of resentment. And I would add to Brene's statement that clear expectations, shared expectations also keep us out of resentment. So one of the things that I look for in my life, having done this work is, I try to be cognizant of when I'm feeling resentful. Resentful. It allows me then to look back a little bit and say, hmm, was there an expectation I didn't define? Was there a boundary I didn't set? It allows me to have that internal locus of control versus getting to a place of resentment and pointing my fingers to people that I think let me down or that didn't adhere to a boundary that I set that I didn't hold them to. So locus of control, expectations, boundaries all really come together for us to be able, be able to have healthy functioning teams. And these are not natural practices for most of us, right? Most of us I have been a part of teams that avoid these conversations rather than step into them. I wanna give you an example of the activity that we do around, the, around boundaries. We ask people just to brainstorm, what are some helpful behaviors that you would like out of the adults in the workplace? And we very purposely have that be external. What do you want all these adults around you doing? And they brainstorm a list of, these are behaviors that I want out of the adults in the workplace. Of course, we come back to say, well, if you expect that of everyone else, then you probably also expect that of yourself, right? So greeting each other with a smile, cleaning up after yourself, being open and honest with each other when we need to take time away to meet our needs. You know, these are typical kinds of things we would like to see out of the adults in our workspace. These things that we would hope to see out of others and ourselves, those are our yeses. Let's put our culture, our well-defined culture as our yes. And then ask ourselves, what do I need to say no to in order to support this yes, this healthy culture that I really would like to be able to work in? And so we then begin to ask people, if these are your yeses, what are some no's that you might need to say? And so I need to say no to working nonstop. I need to say no to some extra duties. I need to say no to saying yes without understanding the why, what, and how. I need to say no to negativity that's not productive, just workplace gossip. I need to say no to staying up late because I'm not the best person to be this, this uh, culture builder. There's lots of things we might need to say no to, but most of us aren't great at no. And so these are the tips for how, once I understand that I need to set a boundary, how do I go about setting that boundary? And it begins by identifying your yes. If I can tell you my yes, you are much more likely to get on board and supporting me to get there than, I, than beginning with my no, because my no is about you. Let's start with me. This is my yes. Can you help me to reach my yes? And this is what I need from you in order to help me to reach my yes. And that's where the no comes in, right? So something as simple as workplace gossip. I am so working at not being a gossiper at work. So even though this conversation feels interesting to me, I'm gonna ask you to, to agree that I step out 
you know, or I'm going to ask you to change the subject. Can we change the subject on this one? I'm starting with my yes. Of course, like anything else in life, we treat, we teach people how to treat us. And so the rest of this is about with boundaries is to, to say them, to say it in the moment, to be clear and direct. Don't use a lot of fancy language and invite people to be involved in how we're going to meet this boundary and support my yes. Oftentimes I find when I start with a yes, people are like that, oh yeah, Sue, why don't I call you back in an hour, right? I don't even have to ask what it is I wanted. I don't even have to put the boundary up. That's simply stating my yes. People love to step in and say, well, let me help you with that, right? So we are going to, people tend to want to engage in boundary setting and we want it to be relevant and shared for it to last. And then of course, pointing out violations in the moment. This is where we teach people how to treat us. I can tell you time and time again something, but if I don't react to it when it happens, you're learning that Sue talks a lot, but doesn't follow through. So I don't need to follow through either, right? So how important and really compassionate boundaries are to be clear and direct, start with your yes, and then, and then hold to it. It doesn't mean getting angry, Anger comes from a place of resentment and resentment comes from not holding to our boundaries much sooner. So the last piece that I wanna go over with you is how do we move all of this into a, a defining our culture in a way that we can act on it together, that in, someone new can come into our environment and we don't have to wonder what's the impact of that human gonna be on the environment we are clear about the environment and we're inviting that new person into um, aspiring for the same culture that we all aspire to. So typically what we do is take that list of, this is the way I want adults to behave, that the, um, the list that I just showed you here are yeses. And if we do this with a large organization, we have groups across the organization developing their list of healthy adult behaviors. At Rogers, we had multiple groups working through the compassion resilience work. And when they came to, to the um, healthy adult behaviors, we collected what it is that these groups were saying. And we looked at where were themes across the organization. And that's where we came up with Rogers All Staff Behavior Agreements. This is where we move from our values to our specific behaviors. And then we're very clear that these behaviors are aspirational. Again, no human being, does this 100% of the time. But if you and I agree that we're gonna to work to seek to understand and value diverse perspectives, number three on our behavior agreements, if you and I agree that that's what we're gonna to work towards, then if you come at me with judgment, I have the right to say to you, well, can we take a moment? I, I'd love for you to just get a little curious about where I was coming from there, right? That, that allows me to ask that of you because we've agreed that these are the behaviors we're aspiring to. It also allows me not to hit you back with judgment, right? We're all working towards becoming the person that can behave in these ways the majority of the time. So again, each one of these areas that we focus on is trying to open up conversation at the right level and equip employees to have those conversations, not to always think when there's a challenge in the work environment that they have to go to HR, to a manager, to a supervisor to help mediate, but we're beginning to equip employees to have these conversations early on and to create the culture they want. I mean, these, it's really nice for me when I do this work at Rogers, no matter who I'm doing with it, this wasn't top down. This wasn't a bunch of senior executives saying, this is how we want to behave. These were employees defining this is what we'd like. This is how we want to be in our culture together. So all staff behavior agreements. And um, before I open us up to questions, I just want to share another just self-care moment with you. All of this that I've been sharing with you requires a lot of um, coming together. Um, it, it, it requires courage. It requires us to believe that we can go into hard places and come out in a better place. And oftentimes 
we look to people in our workplace that are difficult for us and we think, how can I engage with this human being that my experience has been difficult with up to this point? And so this is a mindfulness practice that we've shared. And often we have people ask for this slide. We've developed some just cards that we give out to people to help them remember this practice. So if you would bring to mind someone in your work environment, and maybe someone in your extended family or your friendships, but bring to mind someone that presents some challenge for you in relationships. Someone that you think you might wanna have a courageous conversation with, but you tend to back off rather than have the conversation. And as you bring that person to mind, the mindfulness practice is to say to yourself, just like me, they're seeking happiness. Just like me, they're trying to avoid suffering. Just like me, they've known sadness, loneliness, and despair. Just like me, they're seeking to fulfill their needs. And just like me, they're learning about life. Practicing that mindful approach as you consider connecting with people that you have a history of having some difficulty with can help you to be in the place that you want to be. It doesn't guarantee the reaction of the other person, but it helps you to ground in your truth and the truth of humanity before you do this work of identifying where you have control of speaking up and asking, being curious about expectations of trying to set boundaries from a place of compassion, addressing the fatigue that you feel, looking for ways to have a more life-giving experience in the workplace than life sapping. When we, that's just one aspect of caring for self that we look at in our work. Um, we use this compass that actually came from the work of Scott and Holly Stoner here locally. And it's looking at our heart, spirit, strength, and mind, breaking that down into our relationships, our emotions, our core values, our ability to balance rest and play and work, our stress resilience, our care for the body, our joy that we find in work, and our ability to organize our life in order to support these areas of self-care. One key area, and I'm going to give you a, a link to where you can get all of these resources for free, but one key area that we found when it comes to self-care and our ability to be compassionate with others on an ongoing basis, of course, is our own ability to be compassionate with ourselves. Can we practice the three mindsets of self-compassion? When I make a mistake, when I feel embarrassed by something that I've done, when I feel that I'm less than I had hoped I would be in a, any given situation, am I as kind to myself as I would be to a friend? Do I isolate as though I'm the only one that has made this horrible mistake or do I let that mistake be a reminder that I am a human being, that making mistakes is a part of being a human and does it allow me to connect to my common humanity? And when I'm honest about the feelings that I'm feeling, and I can name them in a mindful way, can I name them, experience, and experience them, and let them move out as I move on? Or do they overwhelm me? And do I become a swirl of negative emotions that is really greater than the experience itself? Can I use mindfulness to help me name and move past some of the hard emotions? of us being less than perfect human beings. All of that self-compassion really puts me in a place of being able to approach my colleagues with compassion as well. All that I've talked to you about is set up in, a, in free toolkits that have exercises, some short documents to read, some agendas for meetings to help people to have these conversations. 
And there, it's called a toolkit for schools. There's a toolkit for health and human services and one a toolkit for parents and caregivers. We've used these with libraries, with manufacturing organizations, with insurance companies. So it's not, uh, it's not limited to how we've named these toolkits. I think you'll find wisdom for whatever sector um, you work in. CompassionResiliencetoolkit.org. It's all free. And at some point, if you start downloading resources, we ask you to sign in. That's just for us to keep track of, um, is the toolkit being used and, and where is it being used? So it, it, um, don't worry if it asks you to sign up that uh, you're gonna be asked for any kind of uh, financial support. Um, all free and accessible. And it's free and accessible because it was so collaboratively developed with our partners, Department of Public Construction, Department of Health, Human Services at the state, um, people like Susan Lubar were a part of uh, giving us much of her wonderful wisdom of the work that she's done. We've had parents, therapists, um, organizational psychologists, educators, all involved in creating this, what we hope is a very practical approach to building the cultures we want in our work environment. So thank you. Um, Thank you for your time. And I am more than happy to take any questions or comments from the group. Thanks, Sue. We have one question so far that I'd like to ask. Are there certain personality traits that affect or help how we approach some of these concepts? For example, if two people are more of a dominant personality type. So asking, can two people with a dominant personality tra um, trait actually do this work? I would hope so. I have a rather dominant personality trait. <laughs> and and I, um, when I think about who I hire, I really like to hire people that also have dominant personality traits so that we, sure. can, uh, we can work as collaboratively as possible to come up with some great ideas. So I absolutely believe they can. Um, sometimes there needs to be some facilitation. And that's some of the work that I do internally at Rogers is help people. You know, if you haven't experienced engaging in conversations in this way, we're asking people to trust, right? We're, we're asking people to trust. And so sometimes we need to help them to move towards that and validate why they may be hesitant. So I say yes, with that caveat that um, who is there. And one of the things that we do is we offer training for teams and organizations to come and learn how to facilitate this work. And so in that, in that um, situation, we would be kind of supporting the team to understand how can they facilitate conversations across our organization. Wonderful. Okay, well, that's all the questions we have for today. Again, a big thank you to Sue. Exonia Bank is thrilled to have hosted this webinar today. I know your pres presentation resonated with me and I'm confident our audience as well. To our audience, the slide presentation and a recording of this webinar will be sent to you via email. You will also be receiving a survey. Please let us know what you thought of today's webinar as well as topics and speakers of interest to you for future events. Speaking of future events, we are planning an in-person luncheon for Thursday, May 5th of 2022. Please mark your calendars. As a participant of today's webinar, you will automatically be receiving an invitation to that event. I hope to meet many of you in person there. Again, a special thanks to Sue for taking time out of her busy schedule and being our guest today. And to you, our audience, thank you for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your day.